Right, so uh, we've been trying to put as many of our lectures up on the um, internet. And if you go to our website, uh, you should actually be able to see a version of everything we've done here. So my initial state and uh, private sector lecture, Kent's implementation and behavior lectures, we'll send around the, the links to this. So um, if you feel you've missed anything in these brilliant performances, uh, you can always go back and watch them on, watch them on YouTube. Um, so, so today is Corruption Day. Uh, we are going to um, <laughs> Anti-Corruption Day. So we're going to um, begin with a, a theoretical overview of the problem of uh, the quality of government. Uh, and then we're going to have two cases on two countries that have dealt more or less successfully with a pervasive corruption problem. So one of them is Indonesia with their KPK. Um, and incidentally, I have a, the last time I taught this case, I taught it in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And Ari, the hero of this case, actually was there in the classroom with us. And so he could actually answer uh, questions that uh, the students had in the discussion. Uh, so we're going to do this KPK case on Indonesia. And then in the afternoon, uh, we're going to do the case on Gifford Pinchot and the US Forest Service, which is a case where the United States had to deal with an internal uh, corruption problem. So let me begin uh, with this overview. Uh, so this is uh, pretty basic stuff, but I think it's important in understanding some of the efforts to reform the quality of government. So nobody in the world is happy with the quality of governance you know, anywhere. Uh, and there's no country in the world that couldn't use better uh, quality uh, bureaucracy, uh, delivery, service delivery, security, and the like. And the question is, you know, how do you get there? And what are some of the strategies that have been used? So we'll just begin with, oh, there we go. All right. And again, this uh, really does have to do with the topic that Kent addressed, which is implementation. So the quality of government is really, uh, the policy is set by the politicians. They want the government to do something like get doctors into rural areas or, uh, you know, build infrastructure. Uh, and the question is, how do you actually make that happen? Uh, and what are some of the generic ways? Now, first question uh, that we just need to get out of the way is, why is the public sector different from the private sector? And we already touched on that uh, a bit uh, yesterday. So. I think there are several reasons. Uh, this is the one we discussed yesterday, which has to do with the fact of bankruptcy, that uh, the biggest discipline of a public sector organization is the fact that it can go bankrupt if it's not efficient. Uh, and that serves as a tremendous stimulus to people to keep it going uh, uh, and to make it uh, make, earn money. That's the reason, you know, the incentive behind PTPK in Indonesia, building the bus terminal efficiently and so forth. And uh, for better or worse, public agencies can't go bankrupt. So, I don't know what the tenure rules are in the Indian civil service, but I suspect none of you particularly worry about your agency being simply abolished and you're being cast off you know, uh, into the streets. Um, I know all of you work hard as professionals, but in many bureaucracies, this lack of the fear of bankruptcy uh, you know, uh, leads to uh, a certain amount of uh, inefficiency. So this is something we saw in, Hyder, in the Hyderabad case particularly, that public agencies are all subject to mandates. They take orders from the political layer, uh, but they're not in control of what those are. Uh, they can't shape their own objectives. And that is, again, different from the private sector. So in a private sector firm, what's the, you know, what's the chief mandate? It's to make money, right? either for the family that owns the business or for the shareholders of a public uh, corporation. There's a single, very clear mandate. Uh, and if it's a family-owned business, you know, you're actually in control of what you're doing. Public agency, you're ordered to do things. Uh, you go work for a minister who's a political appointee. You work for a government that uh, has its own ideas on what to do. Uh, this is another serious issue with public sector um, agencies. So what happens at the end of the fiscal year if you have unspent money in your budget? Spend it. You spend it, right? <laughs> you try to get it out of the 
off your books as quickly as possible. Why? <coughs> yeah. I mean, the finance ministry the next year will cut your budget. They'll say, look, you didn't spend this money, so obviously you didn't need it, and you, you know, you're worse off. Uh, so there's, no, um, there's really no incentive to economize in a public sector uh, agency because you cannot retain uh, earnings. You can't pay your uh, civil servants bonuses for doing their jobs better. Uh, you can't you know, motivate them in the way that private sector firms can. Uh, Generally speaking, uh, in the public sector, you have a much harder time um, controlling factors of production, particularly labor. Now, I believe I was told that in India, you've got also pretty strict rules about firing in the private sector as well, right? Um, so that may not be as sharp a distinction in the United States. Uh, it is, and also politically, in many countries, you have very powerful uh, public sector unions. I mean, we saw that, of course, in the Hyderabad, you know, Delhi cases, uh, where you can't get efficiencies by laying off redundant workers. Uh, certainly in the United States, we've got very flexible labor markets, and so it's quite easy to get rid of uh, workers that are not um, contributing particularly, all right? So, let's see. So this is, uh, this is basically the set of things that are constraints on the public sector that really don't exist uh, in a private sector firm. And as we'll see, most of the suggestions for reform of the public sector have all involved uh, trying to introduce some of these private sector practices into the public sector. Okay, now. This uh, sentence is my central insight into organizational theory. I've never gone to business school. I've never taken a management course or an organizational behavior course. Uh, so I don't know whether this is what uh, is taught uh, in that kind of a course. But it is something that I have observed from my own personal experience and from thinking about organizations, that the central problem of all hierarchical organizations is this problem of delegated discretion. Uh, all organizations have to delegate discretion or authority to lower levels of the organization. But the moment they do, uh, they get into trouble because they lose control. Now, why do you need to do this? Uh, there are really two reasons. So speed is obviously one thing. If you have to make a decision through a big administrative hierarchy where the order you know, uh, has to go through many layers uh, of uh, bureaucracy. Obviously, things are going to slow down. But the local knowledge part is really, I think, pretty critical uh, and I think is one of the big drivers. So let me skip ahead to this slide. Uh, these two gentlemen were two very prominent economists from the middle of the 20th century. Uh, on the left, you have Joseph Schumpeter, and on the right, you have Friedrich Hayek. So in the late 1940s, there was a big debate between these two gentlemen as to whether a centrally planned socialist economy or a free market economy was more efficient. Now, today, it seems like this is a kind of silly argument. Of course, the market economy is better. But at that time, it wasn't obvious that this was the case because the capitalist world had just suffered through the Great Depression. Uh, you had continuing high levels of unemployment. In the meantime, uh, Russia had grown you know, very rapidly. It had industrialized in less than a generation. Uh, and it was not clear that you couldn't actually get better results by having a centralized uh, 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 economy. And so there was a serious debate not over the political aspect of communism versus democracy, but over the pure economic um, characteristics of a centralized versus a market economy, uh, Hayek wrote an article, uh, I believe in about 1947, called The Local Uses of Knowledge in an Economy. And he said, the problem with centralization is the following. In any economy, and particularly in a high-tech modern economy, 90, 95% of all the knowledge that's relevant to the production of goods and services is going to be local in nature. Meaning, you're in a factory, you know, you're putting a door on a, on a car chassis as it goes by the assembly line. The door doesn't fit properly because the subcontractor hasn't given you the right part. Who is going to know 
that that's the case? Is it the assembly line worker that's actually putting the part on, or is it a vice president in the corporate headquarters, you know, uh, somewhere in the distant city said, no, it's the assembly line worker because they are closer to sources of local knowledge. Uh, and he said that because of that fact, uh, any economic system that depends on knowledge you know, traveling from local sources all the way up through a centralized hierarchy and then back down is obviously going to be much more inefficient because you'll get all sorts of distortions. So in the uh, former Soviet Union, uh, there was an office, there was a ministry in Moscow called Goskomtsyan, which in Russian is the state ministry for prices. So if you know how the Soviet economy worked, there were no market transactions. There was a single ministry that allocated inputs and outputs from every economic actor in the country. And it set prices, transfer prices, between these, um, you know, between these uh, uh, factories. Uh, now you think about this, a, uh, a single jet airliner, like a Boeing 777, has on the order of you know three, four, five million different parts in it, uh, and you think about the mind-boggling complexity of a ministry that was trying to build a jetliner, a modern jetliner, where a bureaucrat has to set an individual price for all you know let's say five million parts that go into this jetliner. I mean, it's obviously you know not possible to do. Uh, now back in the 1940s, the Soviet economy was much simpler. You know, so you have a ministry with a thousand bureaucrats. Each of them sets, you know, let's say ten prices a day. You can set several thousand prices throughout the economy. Maybe it could have worked uh, in that period, but obviously, as the economy gets more complex, the goods and services produced are more complex. This system just completely breaks down. And he said, Hayek, uh, the gentleman on the on the right, said. This is why a market economy has to be more efficient, because what a market economy does is it takes all these decentralized buyers and sellers, they negotiate, uh, they set a price, the price is a signal for relative scarcities, and they are gonna know what the relative scarcities are much better than any government bureaucrat sitting uh, in a ministry. So they had this argument, I think in the end, everybody recognized that uh, Hayek won the debate because in fact, uh, the centralized economy in the Soviet Union froze up uh, because of these rigidities. And in fact, uh, if you read any detailed accounts of how it worked, because the allocations of inputs and outputs never matched, they actually created a quasi-barter system you know, where one factory would take its excess output and trade it with another factory because the bureaucrats you know, really didn't know what the actual market uh, conditions were. And so today, after the collapse of the Soviet system, after the collapse of central planning, I think you know, everybody recognizes that Hayek was essentially right that local knowledge uh, exists in all organizations and if you don't take advantage of that local knowledge, you're not gonna succeed. Who has the local knowledge? It is people at the bottom of the organization. It's the frontline workers and it's not the people at the top of the hierarchy, all right? So that uh, then uh, is one of the uh, reasons why you need to delegate because you need to uh, be able to empower those people that have that knowledge with the authority to make decisions on their own. Uh, another really good example of this is in military organizations. So we all think of military organizations very hierarchical, top-down, commander gives orders and everybody follows it like a robot. Fact of the matter is that the best military uh, organizations are ones that delegate huge amounts of authority to, you know, the 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 the, the first lieutenants that are you know right there uh, on the ground. And in fact, the Wehrmacht, the German army uh, in World War II, was famous for pioneering uh, something that came came to be known as um, mission orders. They called it Aufstragstaktik, in which uh, commanders were instructed uh, to give only the most general kinds of orders about operational goals, but to leave everything else to the lowest level of command possible. Because you're the lieutenant with you know, your, your squad, you're attacking a hill, you're the one that realizes that there's a, you know, there's a big obstacle on the way and you're not gonna be able to get to that objective. It's not the commander at the back lines. And so actually after Vietnam, you know, there was a, 
Vietnam was a big trauma for the United States because, among other things, the army did not perform well. And they actually went through this big renovation in the way that they train their officers, in which some of these German methods were imported. And today, you know, it's the case that every young officer is told, you are going to be given command authority because you're the one that's in contact with the enemy. We're only going to give you the most general kinds of, of mission orders. And so uh, during the invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, you know, they, the, when the, the 3rd Infantry Division got up to Baghdad, uh, it was actually the local commander on the, so they were expecting that they would have to, you know, besiege Baghdad and it would take two or three days in order to break down resistance. And actually the local commander there realized that the Iraqi army had largely collapsed. And so he simply on his own ordered the occupation of the city and it happened within, you know, two or three hours. Uh, because that, so I mean, this is quite apart from the wisdom of the Iraq war, which I think was not a very wise war. But if you're fighting a war, you know, I think what it teaches you is that uh, you need to delegate authority to people that are in, in contact with the enemy, so to speak. You know, the frontline workers that really understand uh, what's happening on the ground. But then, you know, the moment you uh, do that, you lose control. And it's particularly bad in the public sector because you're under much more scrutiny. So in uh, Silicon Valley, you know, uh, you say, OK, we're going to take a decision to invest in certain kind of solar panel, uh, you know, because we think this is a technology of the future. Doesn't work out. Your firm may go bankrupt. You may, you know, start over again with another idea. Uh, and that's fine. It's accepted. And that's actually how innovation happens. Uh, the US government, uh, early in the Obama administration, uh, uh, invested or gave a subsidized loan to a com company named Solyndra, which was in the business of making solar panels. It went bankrupt. The US Treasury lost a lot of money. And the Republicans then used this as a club to beat the Obama administration with, saying, you know, you wasted all this taxpayer money uh, on something that obviously was a boondoggle and you know wouldn't have worked and so forth. And so you know, the kind of, when you delegate authority, you take a risk. You take a risk on the young officer or the frontline worker you know, that's making the decision. Uh, and sometimes the risk doesn't pay off. And if the organization can't tolerate uh, a certain degree of failure, that delegation is going to be held against you. And in the public sector, that's why I think it's harder to delegate. I mean, people at the top are risk averse, and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to be exposed to public scrutiny uh, for bad uh, judgments they make, even if that delegation is necessary to the effective running of a government. All right, so that's one uh, big issue. Now, so this gets down to, I mean, in a way, this overlaps with Kent's behavior change uh, lecture because I think there's two broad models of what motivates human beings to do what they do. Uh, there's actually probably more than that, but, but at least within the academy, uh, I think these are the two approaches. So the first one you know, has to do with incentives. Uh, this is the economist's approach. So what's the basic economic model of human behavior? You know, what does an economist say in the mic? Rational, they're rational, and what are they trying to do? They're, they're, trying, to maximize, they're trying to maximize utility. So they're rational utility maximizers. Uh, so utility can be defined broadly or narrowly. I think the model doesn't actually make sense unless it's defined fairly narrowly in terms of money or resources. You know, so essentially, the economists are saying human beings are rational, but they want and, and they use that rationality to max their, maximize their own individual uh, uh, benefit. All right? They may cooperate with people, but the only reason they're cooperating with people is they know that the cooperation will make them richer. Uh, as individuals, all right? Uh, and so this creates, um, you know, it's a perfectly fine model of behavior because we all know that people are selfish and, yeah, they do respond to incentives. Uh, and so this leads to, uh, you know, the so-called principal agent framework, which I'll elaborate uh, on in a, in a second, in which the basic way you motivate people in an organization, in a hierarchy, is through incentives. Right? You have to incentivize them to do the right thing, basically give them a bonus when they perform well, punish them, fire them, dock their pay uh, when, they do, uh, when they do poorly. That's one approach, but 